people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Shreya Savichai with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. In view of China's growing economic coercion and its belligerent tactics to bully its neighbors, India and the United States are strengthening their strategic partnership at breakneck speed. Whether it is through bilateral cooperation, the Quad grouping or other multifarious platforms, the two have reiterated their commitments of confronting Beijing's agenda that is principally based on intruding sovereign lands, colonizing countries through debt trap or flexing muscles against smaller nations. No wonder Beijing is rattled and has further stepped up its designs. It's not just the rapidly expanding trade and the arms sales that is bringing New Delhi and Washington closer, but a growing Chinese threat in the Indo-Pacific, including its unilateral bid at expansionism, control over major trade routes on both land and sea, and its hostile intrusions in other sea's territories that has prompted a robust alliance to counter it all. This alliance of the oldest and the largest democracies, India and the US, is committed to containing China's unprincipled and, in some cases, outrightly illegal claims. While the first in-person Quad summit a few days ago had laid the groundwork for the future course of action vis-a-vis rules-based global order and operations in the Indo-Pacific, the recent visit of Deputy U.S. Secretary of State Wendy Sherman clearly underlined how things were going to unfold if Beijing didn't rein in its intolerable designs. We will challenge China where we must, uh, where it undermines our interests, the interests of our partners and allies, or threatens the rule-based, rules-based international order. I think we in India are like-minded in that regard. This deepening partnership, however, is irritating the men in Chinese power corridors. Beijing's media mouthpieces have already been working overtime to discredit and malign the alliance. Apparently, it is the apprehension over the global superpower joining hands with an equal Chinese counterweight, India, that is driving them deranged. In an explosive report released earlier this year, the US State Department confirmed that China wants to constrain India's strategic partnership with the US, its allies and other democracies as it perceives rising India as a rival. But despite all this, it is the Chinese who have grown increasingly aggressive in the last few months. A double-faced Chinese leadership has been rapidly expanding its airfield along India's Ladakh region, where two sides had agreed to disengage after multiple rounds of talks post a violent clash between the two sides. And now India, left with no option but to respond in the sole code of communication that Beijing comprehends as ramping up border infrastructure, procuring weaponry, testing missiles and is increasing its troops. S-400 anti-aircraft system is just weeks away from India's possession. While the Indian Army is consistently expanding its arsenal, the Indian Air Force is all set to increase the number of its fighting squadrons in the coming months. The S-400, uh, as, as per the contract and on schedule, hopefully should be inducted within this year, the first unit. So definitely there has been an increase in their deployment in the forward areas. 
which uh, remains, of course, a matter of concern for us. But we are regularly monitoring all their movements and based on whatever inputs we get, we are also carrying out matching developments both in infrastructure as well in terms of the troops that are ne needed to counter any threat. Amid all this, a U.S. support both at the bilateral and multilateral level has rattled China. And not just China, it's stooge in South Asia, Pakistan, which has been lately plotting and executing some of the most devious plans in the region, including the one in Afghanistan, is also worried at this evolving arrangement. The United States, which considered Pakistan an ally until a few months back, has terminated all forms of leadership level communications in light of its role in the violent Taliban capture of Afghanistan. Pakistan's foreign ministry's correspondence with its embassy in the United States has revealed that it has grown desperate over the U.S. president not considering even talking with Pakistan PM Imran Khan. And the so-called great game in the region, which China and Pakistan thought they were in the driver's seat of, is unfolding differently and to the displeasure and discomfort of the duo, it is going away from them. Moving on, if one phrase could appropriately summarize the current Afghanistan situation, it would be out of cauldron into the fire. The humanitarian crisis that anyway prevailed before the Taliban assumed control of the country has gone further downhill. It's chaos and cries all around. Widespread unemployment, unprecedented displacement and brutal human rights violations at gunpoint are today's normal in Afghanistan. The Taliban, who promised a civil, democratic administration, has clamped down on freedom of speech with severe high-handedness. Have a look at all of it in this report. Braving an increasingly fearful atmosphere, a family wearing white shrouds, a traditional funeral wear, took to streets in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, demanding employment for hundreds of thousands of unemployed workers. While this act would have been hailed in a democratic system for standing up to policies and failure of government, it's nothing like that in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. The family, including the children, is behind the bars. And this is despite the poverty and hunger index worsening by the day in a country that is already suffering from drought and the COVID-19 pandemic. Thousands of Afghans are trying to flee their country every day from Zaranj, the smuggling capital in Afghanistan's Nimroz province due to unemployment, poverty and uncertainty. Hundreds of families, including women and children, are waiting in restaurants and motels to get the chance to cross the border by a smuggler. Half a million Afghans have been displaced in Afghanistan in recent months. The number will grow several times if the health services, schools and the economy, which are on the verge of collapse, break down entirely. According to the United Nations, nearly half the population of more than 18 million people in Afghanistan require aid assistance to survive, while conflict and insecurity have displaced more than 3.5 million with nearly 700,000 people uprooted this year alone. And while the unemployment has dipped to a historic low, the limited ones who have their businesses running are barely making their ends meet. 
سابق کار بسیار خوب بود کارا پشت می رفت بعد مال بار می کرد یاد کمال که می بود خلاص می شد دیگر پیسه پنج دلار خوش می کردم شما فکر کنید دینار ما بار کردیم از کلی کارش دو هزار افغانی رو ما سعود نکردیم تا دو هزار افغانی بعد از چهار صد پنج صد زیر ما خرچ کنن بله می فیلند سوبه کی نماز خانه کیلو نواد افغانی ما گاز پر کردیم The future doesn't look bright, with most of the international donors freezing their assistance after the Taliban swept to power. Afghanistan also faces economic problems such as a cash liquidity crisis. A 606 million US dollars flash appeal launched in September to assist more than 10 million vulnerable Afghans is less than 40% funded. People are clueless as to who they should approach to get their issues resolved. And these are those tangible issues that are directly affecting the day-to-day -day lives. Rest of them, including a dwindling women workforce, strict imposition of Sharia, and a wide-ranging curb on fundamental rights, including the freedom of speech, have not even gathered enough traction owing to the crisis of food and shelter. The UN Human Rights Council has agreed to appoint a special rapporteur on Afghanistan to probe alleged violations and to maintain a spotlight on the country, especially on the rights of women and ethnic minorities living under Taliban rule. Critics call it a symbolic measure. And with hundreds of thousands of them already living under abject poverty in hostile conditions, the fears of the worst humanitarian crisis exploding out of the situation could come haunting quicker than the experts predict, exactly like the Taliban's swift Kabul capture in a matter of days. Moving on, as if these state atrocities were not enough, a natural calamity descended upon the people of marginalized Balochistan province this week. A massive earthquake of magnitude 5.7 that struck the region in the early hours of the 7th of this month killed at least 20 residents and injured hundreds. Locals fear more deaths. The situation is being assessed by the authorities and compensation has been signalled but sceptical observers are not sure if the real affected people are going to receive it. Villagers in Harnai village of Koita, district of Balochistan, cleared debris as an earthquake of 5.7 magnitude took a massive toll on lives and infrastructure of the region. The quake which struck when many victims were asleep killed 20 people, most of them women and children, and injured about 300. Locals, while recounting the horrors, call it the unprecedented crisis they had ever witnessed in their lives. It was all cries and cures all around, they said. زلزله کا جھٹکا جب ہے ہم سارے گھروں سے نکلے تو ہر طرف چیخ و پکار و خوف و راس کا ماحول تھا اور لائٹ بھی چلی گئی تھی مکمل اندھیرا تھا بجلی بھی چلی گئی تھی تو مالے والے ایک دوسرے کی مدد کے لیے ادھر ادھر باغ دوڑ کر رہے تھے کچھ اوپر گئے وہ اور گھروں کی طرف ہم اس طرف آئے As per the U.S. Geological Survey, the earthquake struck at a shallow depth of about 20 kilometers with its epicenter 102 kilometers east of provincial capital Koita. More than 100 mud houses collapsed and many buildings were damaged. Television images showed buildings with gaping cracks, caved in roofs and crumpled walls. Some media accounts say over 300 houses have turned to rubble. Islamabad has ordered an assessment of the damages and offered condolences to families, but immediate emergency assistance to the affected is yet to reach. Monetary compensation has yet not been announced. The people have now become homeless and are forced to keep their belongings outside as the calamity left the houses shattered. 
اب وہ اتنا خوف ہوئی رہا سے اب رات ہے تقریباً ہم نے سب نے سارے مالے نے بلکہ پورے یہ شہر نے باہر رات گزارنی ہے اس کنڈیشن میں گھر اور مکان کمرے نہیں ہے کہ ہم اندر رات کو رہ لیں اپنے کمروں کے اندر یا برامدوں میں سارے ڈیمیج ہو گئے پاکستان سیٹس آن ٹاپ آف کلائرنگ ٹیکٹونک پلیٹس اینڈ ارتھ کوئکس آر کامن A quake of 7.7 magnitude that hit Kuwaita in 1935 killed between 30,000 and 60,000 and destroying much of the city. And now when everything has been destroyed for hundreds of them, it remains to be seen if an alacrity is shown by the administration to assist or relocate the affected. If observers are to be believed, the people in Balochistan who are anyway considered second-class citizens are unlikely to receive the assistance they would require after losing it all. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. Taiwan has opposed China's application to join a major Pan-Pacific free trade pact, saying if China joins it before Taiwan, there are risks it could block their application. Taiwan and China both applied last month to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP, but China says it opposes Taiwan, which it claims as its own territory. Taiwan has been angling for free trade deals with other countries, especially other democracies. Taiwan's economy minister said if it joined, it would not need to seek a separate agreement with Australia or fellow CPTPP applicant Britain. Kikkoman, a Japanese soy sauce, is a universal seasoning. The naturally brewed soy sauce is not only used for Japanese cuisine, but is cherished in many countries around the world. Founded in 1917, Kikuman Corporation is based in Noda city of Japan's Chiba prefecture. It produces soy sauce and other food seasoning to make the delicacies around the world more appetizing. The original form of soy sauce was introduced from China in 1200s. And like other things introduced from China, Uh, soy sauce was modified to fit Japanese food culture after 400 years since the original soy sauce was introduced. About the same time, our founding family started soy sauce manufacturing. Mogi, Takanashi, and Horikiri family had a great role uh, in terms of development of the soy sauce industry in the region. During the Second World War, the soy sauce industry faced decline. However, Kikoman preserved its original method of producing soy sauce. Kikoman's century-old method of making soy sauce enriches world's food culture. The International University of Japan, or IUJ, is located in Nagata Prefecture. It's a global university where every student speaks English as a common language and foreign students can study Japanese based on their requirement. International University of Japan welcomed new students on October 1. This year, 189 students from 53 countries took admission in the university. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, most of the students could not attend the welcome ceremony, but they joined virtually. Aeon 1% Club scholarship is based on the principle that the major Aeon Group companies donate 1% of their pre-tax profits to contribute to the society and global tie. Two students from Vietnam and Indonesia support by Aeon 1% Club scholarship through their virtual participation. We only put it in the um, landfill and then there will be no kind of uh, recycle or t- recycle technology. That's why uh, we need to learn, Vietnamese people need to learn more about the experience in Japan and then try to apply. Second grade students supported by Aeon 1% Club scholarship have enjoyed study and various activity to absorb deep knowledge. 
Aeon's principle is to establish world circle steadily and develop future global talents. India's colourful culture is at its best during the 10 days long Navratri and Ram Leela celebrations held across the country. The festivals are celebrated in a different way where few mark the victory of good over evil. Similarly, Ram Leela depicts the life of Lord Ram who defeated Ravan, the demon king of Sri Lanka and it is performed to coincide with nine nights Navratri. The scene of Ravan's execution is enacted in the form of a dramatic folk play known as Ram Leela, which has still recollected its fascination over the years among all. Take a look. One of the widely performed traditional art plays, the 10-day Ram Leela play, has started across India. Ram Leela is chiefly enacted to celebrate Lord Ram's victory over Ravan and to give out the message that good always trumps over evil. Every year, Ram Leela is staged during the nine-night Hindu festival of Navratri. Lord Ram, one of the incarnations of Lord Vishnu and Ayodhya Prince, is known for showing the path of righteousness to his devotees. According to Hindu mythology, it is believed that Ravan, the king of Lanka now known as Sri Lanka, captured Sita, who was later rescued by her husband Ram after defeating the evil king. As per the beliefs, this staging of Ramayan is based on the Ram Charitramanas, one of the most popular storytelling forms in the north of the country. The sacred text devoted to glory of Ram, the hero of the Ramayan, was composed by Tulsi Das in the 16th century in a form of Hindi in order to make the Sanskrit epic available to all. It is generally performed in open space on a large platform. It sets up a great show with modern illumination and technology. The audiences were spellbound after they saw the creative play in the form of poetic recitation, though hearts with devotional songs. Last year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Ram Leela was either cancelled or went online. However, this year, include placement of chairs with at least five feet distance, no entry into the premises without wearing a mask, and the ground will be sanitized after every performance. It is believed the festival of Navratri is a significant Hindu festival that is observed over nine nights and ten days in which nine forms of goddess Durga are worshipped. During the sacred period of Navratri, people observe fast and some restrict their diet to fruit and vegetables, spurning meat, onions and garlic. Navratri culminates on the 10th day, coinciding with Dashera festival with the killing of demon king Ravan, signifying the victory of good over evil. Over the centuries, Ram Leela has evolved into a highly developed art form and the most dramatic aspect of the celebration is the final day when the gigantic effigies of ten-headed Ravan, his brother Kumbhkarn and son Meknath are burned. 
With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.